In the early days of D&D, we got some really weird monsters, and today's creature is no exception, so hide your magic items because this long-snouted nuisance is on the prowl. Welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up creatures from past editions of D&D and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition D&D game. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are going to be talking about a creature that comes to us from the 1st edition Fiend Folio, which was later reprinted in the 3rd edition Fiend Folio for Dungeons and Dragons. I am of course talking about the Disenchanter. This creature is to magic items what the rust monster is to what was your favorite set of armor. Essentially these guys are horse sized creatures with anteater like snouts that can suck the magic out of magical items, literally. I really do like the original design of these creatures much more than their 3rd edition counterpart because when they brought them into 3rd edition for whatever reason they decided to swap out their long snout with a gross long tongue for who knows why. And honestly the 3rd edition version of this creature is kind of useless, it's like CR 17 and just I didn't take anything from that monster. I only mention it because if you do like this creature and you're curious, definitely check out the Fiend Folio for 3.0 because there is a version of this creature that's a little different than what I have here, so if you like the concept but you don't love my version of this monster, check that out. That aside though, I do really think these creatures are super interesting and they provide us a nice little niche in Dungeons and Dragons that you don't get from many other creatures. So as always, I'm going to talk about what these guys can do in combat, some modifications I've made to my version of the creature, which you can find in the description below if you're interested in the stat block, and of course how you can actually use it in your game. So to get things started here, let's talk about... As far as physical combat goes and physical capabilities, these guys are very similar to a warhorse. They're large, they've got a 40 foot speed, and they have an attack with their hooves. They do however have magic resistance, so they get to make all their saves against magical effects with advantage, which is super nice because that helps them survive a little bit longer. And they're also immune to damage from weapons that are not magical, which again also helps them survive a little bit longer. But of course what sets this creature apart is their signature ability, which is simply called Disenchant. This is a melee attack that the Disenchanter makes with its long snout, not against a specific creature, but against a specific item that creature is holding or has on their person. To keep things simple, we use the same armor class for the object that the creature would normally have, so if it's attacking the paladin who has an armor class of 18 for example, it still has to beat an 18 in order to hit one of its items. On a successful hit, it drains that item of one of its magical properties. So say for example you have a plus two sword of returning that whenever you call it to your hand it will suddenly appear even if it's miles away. Well, it's going to start out by draining away that returning capability. So that item is permanently changed to no longer have that property and the disenchanter kind of absorbs that magical energy. If it targets that same item again, its bonus goes down by one, so it would go from a plus two longsword to a plus one longsword. And if it targets it a third time, it would then go from a plus one longsword down to just a regular old longsword which is no longer magical. These permanent changes are exceptionally brutal when it comes to magic items because players hate having things taken away from them and these creatures will be hated if you use them in your game the same way rest monsters are reviled for that exact reason. But it also makes the disenchanter itself harder to kill because if it takes away the magical aspect of a weapon, that weapon can no longer hurt the disenchanter, which is exactly why they do it. There are a few specifics if you look in the stat block for how it actually works with different kinds of items. For example, if it's targeting a staff that has charges, it takes away a certain number of charges from that staff based on a roll, which I believe is 4d12. And if it's targeting armor, it kind of works the same way as it would against a weapon. It takes away a plus one bonus, so that plus two armor goes down to plus one, and then from plus one to plus zero, and now it's just a regular set of plate mail or whatever it happens to be. And if the item is some kind of cloak, it takes away one of its magical properties as determined by the DM. Generally, it starts with the most powerful magical properties and works its way down rather than up. And how does this creature know which of the many items on the party's person are magical and which ones are not? Well, this creature has another ability called Magical Scent. It can detect any magical items within 120 feet, tell what school of magic they're from, what their rarity is, where they are precisely in relation to itself, and how many of the items are present. 
This is important because the creature is automatically going to know where the most powerful magical items are, and those are the ones it's going to go after first. So you might be wielding a plus two longsword and have on a set of plus one plate mail, but if you've got some kind of powerful artifact in your bag or some other kind of powerful magical item that is on another party member, it's going to know to go after that first. That's the great thing about its long snout is it can navigate its way into all the nooks and crannies wherever your players might be stashing away the goods. And from a flavor perspective, this creature has kind of a general instinctual draw to areas that might have more powerful magic present than others. However, mechanically speaking, this ability does only function exactly and precisely within 120 feet. So it has to be at least somewhat nearby the party in order to be able to detect their items. These guys are generally pretty docile and aren't going to just start a fight with anybody for no reason. They don't want to try to kill anyone, they just want to feed on the magical energy that is stored within their items. So if your party actually doesn't have any magical items, these guys are nothing to worry about. If they try to initiate some kind of battle with them, they're simply going to just run away most likely. And if they do engage with the party, if they happen to drain all the magic that the party might have, they're then going to stop attacking them and just leave. They don't need to kill the party, nor do they want to, they just want to feed on their items. I think these guys are pretty interesting, and I'm generally quite happy with how they're presented in the book, but there are a few changes I made, so let's look at some. So the first thing I added, which is kind of a no-brainer really, because I was comparing this guy to the Warhorse a lot when it came to physical stats, was giving him that same trampling charge ability the Warhorse has. If you're not familiar with what that is, essentially this means if a Disenchanter moves 20 feet or more towards a specific target on its turn, it can make a hoof attack, and then that creature has to make a strength save of 14 or get knocked prone. If the creature fails its strength save and is knocked prone, then as a bonus action, the Disenchainer can make another hoof attack against that creature. On the surface, that might not seem like a huge deal because ultimately its hooves aren't going to do a devastating amount of damage and realistically it's going to have all the magic items drained before it ever kills anyone in the party unless it rolls some very unfortunately high numbers. But what's good about that is, is because the Disenchainer has multi-attack, if its first attack is the hooves and it knocks the creature prone, it then has advantage when it tries to disenchant something on that creature with its attack roll at least. And of course the extra little bit of damage is never really a bad thing. The other thing I changed here was how this magical disenchantment works with artifacts. According to the way the old book is written, because AD&D was a much more brutal age than the 5th edition world we know and love, if it uses this ability on an artifact, then it uses this ability on an artifact. That item is essentially left inert. This is problematic for a couple reasons. One, I know some people might have artifacts in their game that they're like party items that are key to the main story. And if a disenchainer got its wily snout on that, it would cause huge problems for the campaign as a whole. The other part of this is if you have, say, a paladin in your party who's worked towards getting that holy avenger or whatever important artifact they have, it's kind of not really fun for that player if that's taken away from them. But at the same time, I don't want to say it doesn't affect artifacts because then it becomes kind of inconsequential. And if the party happens to have an artifact, even if it's not a super powerful one, they will always be able to defeat this creature and the creature will just be frustrated and not know how to act towards this item it can't drain magic from. So what my kind of middle of the road compromise was here was to make it so its ability still works on artifacts, but the drain only lasts for one week. So it's still kind of punishing towards the party in the sense where they lose access to this powerful item for a week, but it's not going to totally break your game if they have an important artifact that is central to the story, and it's not going to totally remove something from the game that the players might have grown attached to. That said though, they're not going to know it only lasts a week, and unless they do some research into that, they might be very upset in the moment, but ultimately that's on them, and they'll feel kind of silly about it once the week in game has elapsed and suddenly their magic sword or staff or whatever it is starts working again. I feel like this makes sense from kind of a lore perspective as well, because artifacts are supposed to be items that are so powerful and imbued with magic that they kind of create their own magic in a way. So I feel like it's very possible for a magical artifact to kind of restart itself after being drained like that. However, do take this with a grain of salt, because if in your game, for whatever reason, you need one of these things to drain magic from an artifact, or you just want that to be a possibility, simply allow that to be a possibility. Don't let this change make it so that you think it's impossible for you to have that happen in your game, because it's not, you ultimately get to decide that. This is just a more general use how I think it should kind of work on a day-to-day -day basis. The other thing I thought of that isn't so much a modification as just something that I thought might be kind of cool, 
is you could totally make a version of this creature that instead of making it large, it was huge or even gargantuan and have it as kind of a war elephant. And instead of disenchanting specific items with its trunk, it just kind of exudes a radius of anti-magic. So you've essentially got a walking anti-magic zone that is being used as a war beast. I'm kind of delving into plot hooks a little bit here, but I wanted to just say that in the modifications section because I think it's a cool change that could ultimately change how this creature works, but just something I want to kind of try out in one of my games in the future. But more on that later. As it is, we are now moving into... I think these guys make very interesting random encounters because they're basically camels with trunks that are blue. And if you're running a game for a group of players and they don't find that interesting, then I don't know what to tell you. At the very least, they're probably going to want to check out what these weird creatures are. And if they have any magical items on them, these creatures might make their way to check out the party before they even get the chance. These guys can be useful for nerfing magical items, and I'm not a big fan of doing this because I think magic items are fun, and I think that the more magic items you can give to a party that they can use, the better, as long as it's within reason, but this does provide a good way out for mistakes you might have made earlier on in the campaign, specifically if you're kind of just starting out as a new DM. But this can be a good way out for newer DMs who might have made a few mistakes earlier on in the game and given their players certain items that they kind of regret giving them. In those cases, I always recommend just talking to your players and explaining that you didn't really realize how powerful something was going to be, and outside of the game, just agreeing to kind of dumb it down a little bit or remove it altogether if that's necessary necessary. But if you do that and you're also kind of looking for an in-game justification because you don't want to just kind of throw away part of the story or just ignore that certain things happened, then this can be a good way to do that. Maybe some disenchanters come along and they kind of dumb down some of the power of one of these magical items. It's not the most elegant solution in the world, but it's an option you have if you feel it's appropriate for your game. I think my favorite use of these creatures though is as a mount for anti-magic specific enemies. What I mean by that is maybe you've got an NPC in your game who's some kind of mage hunter who goes on the road and hunts down powerful arcane users or maybe even witches. They would be likely to use one of these guys as a mount because not only can this creature track down their prey, because what witch or powerful wizard doesn't have a bunch of magic items on them at all times, but once they actually get into combat, but once they actually get into combat, the disenchainer can rend some of their powerful items inert. Of course, that does limit the trainer from using any magical items themselves, but you could always rule that they possibly have trained their disenchanter to not go after their items, or maybe they simply just are anti-magic as a form of kind of belief system and they don't believe in using magical items. Or perhaps there's a broad kingdom that has completely outlawed magic and its practice within the borders. And there's an order of knights that answer directly to the king who go around and are kind of inquisitors that look for mages and people casting magic in the streets. And maybe they ride disenchanters as their mounts because for those same reasons I said about our witch hunter scenario. You can also use them as more of a trap than a monster in general. Having these guys as kind of guard dogs or guard horse camel anteater things for a dungeon kind of makes a lot of sense. Because what group of adventurers is going into a dungeon without being strapped with powerful magical items? Unless of course they're just starting out, in which case they might think the blue camels are weird but not think much of it. However, if they are in fact carrying anything magical, these disenchanters will be alerted to their presence almost immediately and will then go after them. And going back to this theme of characters who are staunchly against magic, you could have a villain in your game who is some kind of barbarian or warlord or whatever the case is, who is so against the use of magic that he uses a disenchanter, again, as a mount, or even just a companion, to simply remove magic items, or remove the magic from those items, rather, when they are brought to his attention. Ultimately, I think these guys have a bunch of potential, and they're pretty fun, and your party will hate them, but they kind of mix up the game a lot in a few different ways. And that is all I've got on the disenchanter for today, so hopefully you enjoyed listening to me talk about them, hopefully you found this useful, and hopefully you can find a place for one of these guys in one of your future games. If you've ever used these creatures or had them used on you by a DM in the past, please leave a comment below and tell me about it. I'd love reading your guys' stories. And as always, if you are new to the channel and you want to support what I'm doing here, please just subscribe. That is the best way to do that. Subscribing and spreading the word to your friends. And if you are interested in the community here, you can find all the links to our Discord, Reddit, Patreon, all that good stuff in the description below. And as always, the monster stat block is also in the description below. And of course, if you are one of my lovely patrons, you can find the monster manual style kind of Photoshop stat block on the Patreon page. Anyways, that's it for today. I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. I do appreciate it and I will see you next week. Till then.